they are all welcome to wear on behalf of the independent living movement. Uh, as long as we have cost and payment to any person's organization to the GPO. And just before we start it tonight, this uh, event more inclusive. We have a uh, 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 sign language interpreter asking. Uh, and we also have live speech text, text captions. Uh, on the bottom of uh, the Zoom, if you want to access that. And also, the, the event uh, is being recorded and we made made available on the uh, our YouTube page next week, can next week. So, this is the second of our webinar. Uh, in fact, she entitled uh, Everything You Want to Know About Dis Disability, both very fast. And this is our sex, let's talk about sex. I won't finish that with the stuff of sex, maybe, but it's just the stuff of sex. So it's, it's, a, it's a panel. You'd be glad to hear it's a panel of discussion uh, on the MC. So you won't be hearing anything about my sex. Uh, I'll be keen to myself. <laughs> but, but I'm delighted to, uh, to be joined here uh, by uh, Selena Bonney, who's the Illinois Independent Living Movement uh, Voice Chairman. We have Jenny Williams from uh, Enhanced the UK, which should be a really interesting, uh, inter interesting contributor. I think that when we, when we, when we, when we heard this, uh, I wonder if Jenny quickly ripped out uh, an accessible copy and showed us all. So we look forward to more of that uh, uh, accessible uh, uh, sex toy by uh, Jenny. And then uh, also we have a uh, we have now John from Full Spectrum Ireland, and we have Dr. Anya Stern from the NUIG Galway University. So, so just to put today in context, uh, it's uh, very much about uh, following up on Ireland's commitment to making the, the UN, UN Convention for the Same People a real, a real, a real active and practicing document. I worked with that myself 20 years ago in New York. So it's great to see uh, 20 years coming to life. And today, especially about art, uh, focusing on uh, bringing an article of 23 a lawyer uh, to a DPO, Disabled Persons Organization, platform. So, uh, so the uh, article 23 is about respecting the home and on family and community. So it's about, about looking at discrimination against the same people, looking at marriage, relationships, parenthood. Uh, myself and a family with two, two children. Uh, it's looking at it's looking, uh, around the uh, relationships and the uh, same people, exploring relationships on an equal basis. And what we all know in Ireland uh, in, in the 24th century is that. Uh, the same people and myself, I do a lot of workshops with the, the same people in the day centers around, around the country. There's just no discussion, no platform to look at uh, positive sex, sexual uh, exploration uh, for and with the same people. And also look at even like sexual health awareness, uh, assisted reproduction, and, and parenthood. So today's webinar is giving us to you, the audience, a chance to hear disabled activists, not just disabled people, just disa disabled activists that have years behind them, and researchers as well, uh, academic researchers, contributing to a distaste and discussion around sexual awareness and sexual posi positivity. And again, how do we how do we get to realise the UN Convention? I know as the days go, realise an article attention to the ground. So, uh, I'm the MC, so uh, I'll try and keep my work out if possible. And uh, I promise that uh, we're going to finish this by three o'clock. And uh, yeah, as I say, it's being recorded, so uh, anybody can, we hope to get back up on my YouTube page next week. So, first of all, I'm going to ask each panel to introduce yourself, right? So, Selena, you're an uh, independent movement for right? chairperson. Uh, myself and yourself, the uh, uh, sexuality and conference about 20 years ago with the Forum, Forum of People with Disabilities in Dublin. And we had to lock the door. I think we had nearly mm -hmm. 400 a day people. So, see, can you give us a bit of background on yourself and why you're here today? 
Sure. Hi. Thanks, Peter. And hello, everybody. Um, yeah, well, I'm a disabled woman. I'm a mother. I'm Indian and Irish. More proud of my Indianness, I have to say. Um, and I've been an activist in the disabled persons movement for well over 30 years. And, um, and it's interesting that Peter mentioned the conference 20 years ago. I actually was part of the conference 30 years ago that was run by um, a different DPO. And we had to lock the doors of the mansion house because we couldn't get let everybody in. And that was the first real conversation about disabled persons and sexual citizenship and being parents and that whole wonderful part of, of life. Um, so yeah, I'm feeling a little bit old, I think today when we're talking 20 and 30 years ago, but it's great um, to be here again today and to feel like we are actually moving forward. We, we have achieved things and a lot of interesting, exciting things happening at the moment uh, in that area. My day job is as a public servant, um, an access and equality officer, but really my, my passion and my academic life uh, would be completely around the area of reproductive justice and sexual citizenship. Um, that's where I'm very much focused these days. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, Jenny, and this is a recording to uh, Jenny. Uh, uh, I've got quite a strong double and kudos action and some impairment. They were called cerebral palsy, not actually sure what that is, but, but sometimes uh, my colleague, Damien, Damien Walsh, might jump in to translate my request. So, so Jenny, can you give it a bit of a background to yourself? Okay, sorry, I've got double double interpretation going on here um so um hello everybody yes i'm uh, i'm jenny williams and um i'm the founder um and the ceo of the charity enhance the uk um so i set up enhance about 15 years ago now um as a disabled woman myself i was working in care for um, all my working life really and working in um in care homes and looking on people's um, care plans and really noticing actually um, there's nothing uh, at all on people's care plans about people's sexual needs, people's sexual identity, really anything apart from basic medical needs, you know, and, um, and really started questioning that and, and asking my managers and bosses at the time. And I was, I was working for large disability charities and it kept just getting shut down. And I was being told it was inappropriate um, and I realised that the only times where sexual needs or anything to do with sex were being spoken about is when it was being seen as inappropriate behaviour. So I decided that I was going to set something up myself. Um, and as you can imagine, there's no funding, uh, especially not 15 years ago, to talk about sex and disability. So we've run, we set the charity up a bit like a social enterprise. So we run general disability awareness training, deaf awareness, um, looking at access audits. We actually fund the undressing disability campaign. But actually what we found is it works beautifully because there's no point empowering lots of disabled people to go out and be sexually active and, uh, and, and fight for your sexual rights if non-disabled people are not getting that education either and not having that understanding. So the two... Uh, it did me a huge favour that nobody wanted to fund us because now we're not reliant on any funding. We choose our own narrative and the two work parallel, working side by side, non-disabled people and disabled people. Um, so and it's going strength to strength and finally people are taking us seriously as they should. Um, in a nutshell, it's and it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, no, from Sunny Tiger Channel, I, I you know from from Kutlock and I'm uh, looking up here in North Leeds for 20 years and it's grey and wet so no other from the uh, Downsy Rose and Sunny Tiger Channel. No, can you give us a bit, a bit of a background to yourself? Yeah, thanks a million Peter. So my name is Niall Jordan, my pronouns are he, him and his and I'm a founding member of Full Spectrum Ireland. Ireland's first peer-led space for disabled LGBTIQA plus people. Our group mainly runs online drop-ins, some forums looking at sex and sexuality, as well as disability justice. And my work with FSI is around sexual health promotion within the group, 
where we use our members forums to explore our various aspects about our sexualities and disabilities. Thank you very much, nice and, nice and short and snappy. And, uh, I'll, be, I'll be cracking a whip uh, upon the phone <laughs> on stage because we, we have quite tight, tight hours or two. I know you, uh, last one, at least, you get a bit back on to yourself and your, your research was there and you and you, and you was the research that you interested in myself last year was really, really interesting. So, on this, you get a bit back on to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to be as snappy as mine. So my name is Anya Sveren. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Real Productive Justice Project at NUI Galway. Um, and the project since 2019 has been collecting interviews, kind of data from um, people with lived experience of disability. So we try to get cross impairment type where possible and also legal, medical and social work professionals. And we were speaking to them about everything from fertility, contraception, pregnancy, birth, abortion and parenting and how disabled people um, make decisions on those issues, how they can access information, how those decisions can be realised and from the professional's perspective then um, how they can help to deliver services around reproductive justice. Um, so that's the real project we have over 80 interviews collected and along with kind of legislative and policy analysis of the situation in Ireland, we're trying to develop resources for professionals and disabled people about how to better deliver and receive reproductive services that is more um, UNCRPD compliant. And then in my own, my other kind of research interests area is definitely around housing and independent living. And I mean, if you can't choose literally to have a family or not to have a family, um, you know, that, that's Article 19 at the, the very heart of it, choosing where and with whom to live and um, what supports you might need to make that happen. So I see those issues of housing and independent living and reproductive justice as very interconnected. And thanks for having me today. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that last point you made uh, uh, just for myself. Uh, a quick, quick example uh, uh, of a meeting a few years ago. I did one to one with disabled, young disabled people in day centres, and they asked them to get, like, to get their own place, and they all said no. But when we brought them to a community centre with the local, local development company, and we did a workshop with the maps, the money, as well as the and we did a how to book it on a date, things like uh, taxi, uh, restaurants, clothes, condoms. Uh, I asked them, what happens after the date? She said, oh, where do you go? And they all looked quite uh, surprised. They asked again, would you like to get your own place? And all the hands went up, yes, you would like to get your own place. So it was actually, so in, in terms of uh, the day people finding the best platform, the best spaces to discuss sexuality and, and uh, sexual health and sexual awareness, there's a, in my experience, it's, it's to the community, community development platform to have uh, a more suitable space for those discussions and with, with the Jay People's Organization. So, with that in mind, I'm going to ask uh, the, the panelists a course question, first of four, and we have a uh, We've got about 45 minutes to get to the four questions, so uh, I'll be keeping a tight rein on, on, the, on the answer. So we'll take about 10, 10 minutes to get all uh, responses to this, right? So the first question is, what are the specific uh, challenges or disabling barriers in your experience that disabled people face in terms of sex, sex positivity? So, Selena, can you go first? Yeah, I think there, there are a number of barriers, but I think, first of all, we're coming out of a, a, a long time of um, a kind of medicalized dependent model of, of this disability where people were seen as vulnerable and dependent and in some cases, eternal children. And of course, nobody wants to think of their children as sexual beings. So we're kind of, and then of course, there was a lot of um, either people spend a lot of time in hospitals or in residential care where sexuality was just not dealt with. It was just, I, it, it was, if it was an issue, it was a, a problem. 
um, or something to be denied or, or controlled. So that is kind of the historical kind of, you know, barriers that people have faced. As times, as we mentioned there uh, at the beginning, you know, we're at this really over 30 years, really actually finally discussing and, and vocalizing uh, and acknowledging the issues as disabled persons. So we, we have moved on, but I think in today's society, the kind of the, the challenges are one representation in kind of media. And, you know, we go back to the phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, so what, it, there's a need for much more positive, empowered representation of disabled persons um, and to move away from the likes of the, you know, kind of road safety ads and, you know, where disability is seen as worse than de death, these kind of things. So we, we, it's really important to have that positive images and realistic representation. And then the other thing really is that the need for, you know, a lot people are a lot more aware of accessibility for disabled people. Or, um, but what we need people to start thinking about now is, is that we're all more than one thing. We're, you know, what, what, what the term is intersectional. There, there's more than just, you know, because even there recently, the other day, I was in a new a new facility, government built, wheelchair built, wonderful accessible toilet, quite spacious, baby changing facility in there, totally inaccessible, way too high. So while they recognized there were parents and caregivers and they recognized there were disabled persons and they put them both into the same room, they didn't actually go two plus two equals four and go, well, you know, some of the disabled people using this toilet might actually be the caregivers of the babies as well. You know, so these are the kind of challenges that we're still facing. And that's why I'm quite involved in the whole area around uh, reproductive justice and the assisted human reproduction legislation that is being developed. Thanks. I know this, what do you think of the specific challenges for for sexual positivity for disabled people? Yeah. So while there is an aspect of social stigma for many disabled people, one of the greater challenges is in personal advocacy. Finding that space to express one's sexuality is tough for many people, but when you add in disabled identities such as the often desexualized or infantilized learning, to find the words as a continuous conversation is difficult. So a lot of our members might want to talk to sexual health advisors and groups, but finding the right words is difficult. They go into the space, it's very medicalized. So trying to find out different words for different body parts before we even discuss sexual practices is very challenging. When approaching medical supports, as I said, language often uses predominant medical in nature and it's not challenging the understanding. It just simply is, the difficulty is in relating to the language used. Uh, recently proposed changes to language by the HSE literature to accommodate gender in people. Those are people with different gender identities. So we're talking about trans, non-binary, gender fluid people. Uh, the language was scrutinized and reframed as an attack on gender rather than a model of inclusion. Yet in reality, changes to language has been around for a lot longer than that. Even in my own work, one of the terms that we would use is gay by male sex male or you know, lesbian by female sex female, often abbreviated to GB capital MSM and vice versa. These are used just to recognize that sometimes the individual needing access to services do so because they're looking to do so based on what they're looking to do without judgment really. Uh, they're looking for the types of sex that they enjoy to be supported rather than judged by medical practitioners or that feeling it could be judged. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to get there, they often have to go through service providers. They often have to go through DPOs. And trying to have that freedom to have that conversation is really difficult when we don't provide the space to get started. So I think that's one of the very specific challenges facing is finding that safe space to start conversations and develop regularly going forward. I think now it's because that, that today and like your own, your own DPO is that we are leading, leading the way because of space to care and also the disability sector has been quite strong away from and affairs to talk. So I think it should be 
we should be doing this as a part of our get disabled access to creative space, you know. So again, you want to articulate the challenges there, the disabling barriers that, uh, that create disabled people in terms of sex positivity. And how I'm going to follow that very well thought out questions that you guys have just said um but i think without wanting to to repeat i think infantilization is definitely a massive thing um absolutely um but i you know you're just looking at sex education and how um how it really isn't um inclusive or if it is inclusive um there's not that continuity across the board you might have some sex educators that are really trying to be inclusive we work with a great um organization called split banana for example they're great they've come to us we work with them but yeah so um and and we've worked really hard with them but there's lots of people you know lots of um, individuals and generally speaking a lot of sex educators tend to be um female white in their 20s and non you know non disabled and um so even just having those images they aren't there so what a lot of young people are doing is turning to other means of looking you know an understanding about sex and a lot of the time that's porn and then looking at porn and going all oh, right okay that's how it's done that's not how it's done um you know and then not understanding that and then thinking that they they have to get in these positions and be in pain and so there's lots of, um, it's still very negative, you know, and there are some wonderful influences out there on, um, on you know, Insta, et cetera. But you only tend to see those people if you have, follow those people, mm-hmm. if you're actively going out. So then you've got the lack of representation in the media, um, which is still really rife. I mean, you look on Love Island, you know, uh, you know, they get really celebrating. They've got a girl with a cochlear implant. Brilliant. That, that's great. It's, it's really great. But just look at everybody. Uh, she's a supermodel, you know. Um, so it's that real like lack of representation still, and people understanding actually what disability is. And I think a lot of disabled people themselves don't actually even understand that they're disabled, and that comes with it as well. So people, um, and dare I say, women particularly, are pushing themselves through pain barriers when they don't actually need to, and put themselves in dangerous positions. So. It's a huge question with a huge answer, but I'll, I'll keep it to, to that. But lack of representation is a big issue. Thank you. I agree. We, we go find again from 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 Celine and all is that that I roll as a GPO and that that I talk on because it's called the same people. Oh yeah. Oh, we are fans to terms where a researcher and academic in terms of the specific challenges on sex positivity. Yeah, so I think what we saw from our qualitative research was that disabled people experience a lot more intervention in their lives, um, whether you might need assisted human reproduction because of a, a disability or you need you know, personal assistance to go about your day-to-day life. But it's this kind of extra layer of intervention that can be a barrier in itself because you don't know who the people, you know, you can't be guaranteed, and especially with the Irish Catholic ethos of services sometimes. Um, we, we've seen, like we've heard stories of an ethos of an organisation being used to deny someone access to contraception or to even like have that conversation with people. Um, So I think that's one of the bigger ones. And then there's the element of being expected to prove then to all of these layers of, I suppose, bureaucracy that you actually, you're eligible to be a sexual being, that you're eligible to have relationships, that you're eligible to have sex outside of marriage and outside of relationships and eligible to be a parent if you choose um, or to be able to control your fertility if you don't want to become um, a parent. So this having to prove over and above what non-disabled people experience um, really came out in our data. Um, We've heard professionals then saying that they think you know, sexuality and disability belongs in the disability services sector. And we've heard disability service staff saying, well, you know, we try and push people towards mainstream services, but the mainstream services aren't equipped. And equally, a lot of the time, the disability services aren't equipped. So you, you're, you're kind of, you're stuck in a very difficult place. Um, and then because disabled people don't present to a service looking for fertility, contraception, everything, um, there's an assumption then, well, like, we don't need to make our services accessible because we've never had someone make that request. Um, and then equally, that's going to turn people away from even trying to access that service. So it's this um, vicious cycle. And one other thing, and I will be really quick, just about contradictions within systems as well, that people constantly have to battle with. So kind of linking on to the infantilism um, 
assumptions that people won't be having sex, so they don't need contraception, but also, well, you know, they definitely wouldn't be able to have a baby assumption. So we're we're going to put them on contraception to make sure that they don't get pregnant, even though we don't think they're going to be in a consensual relationship, but we're going to, you know, force them onto contraception without their knowledge potentially. Um, So there's these sorts of contradictions that people are constantly coming up against. um, And that can be kind of based on their gender, on their sexuality and their disability, everything um, working together. Thanks, Anya. It's great, great, great your observation in terms of the role of power and choice uh, for and with disabled people. So for disabled people, this will be terrible thinking they know best. And it's definitely not EPOs and uh, again, like today, and uh, all group providing uh, those platforms. And with that in mind, uh, the second question is about is the uh, Follow on from we've identified the, cha- the challenges, the designing values, the sacrifice. What do you, in your, in your opinion, is needed in terms of legislation, promotion, and training for and with the same people? And uh, I'd be interested to, to hear Jenny's voice because uh, Jenny makes a few groups like Split Banana, we can all go. Okay. I'd be interested to hear the uh, UK response to this. Uh, what uh, do you think uh, is needed to co- overcome these challenges? So, Jenny, uh, I'll go to you first. Um, okay, so, I mean, for me, um, training, training, training. Um, and um, so we we developed, so let's look at, they've got, obviously got lots of different groups of people, um, but let's let's look at um, care home providers for, for starters. Um, you know, working as a care of myself for many years, if I, you know, working in a care home, then suddenly, for example, somebody um, said to me that they wanted to buy a sex toy. If I haven't had any training, would I then have the confidence to help someone buy a sex toy? Because it's not just buying that, it's who opens it, who, who charges it, who puts in position, who cleans it, who takes it out, you, you know. Um, so there has to be training and lots of care staff think and, and worry um, that if they if they support somebody with their sexual needs in any way, they're going to get arrested. They're going to get in serious trouble. And so what we've done is write and create this training, which explains very clearly what the law is, what support people should be having, um, what carers can do, how we are, should be asking these questions that go into people's care plans. But also um, the carer's right to say, no, I don't feel comfortable with this, but not the right to say, I don't feel comfortable with this. Therefore, we're not speaking about it. Going and speaking to somebody else. But actually feel very strongly about this is if you become a carer and working in in that environment, understanding from the get go that this is going to be part of your job. And if you're not comfortable with that, then actually this isn't the job for you because you're working with grown ups and grown ups have sexual needs. If they didn't, we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be here. Um, so that's that's a big part of it. Um, equally, educating disabled people themselves um, that, you know, you have the right. You have the right to question. You have the right to ask these questions. You have the right to say no. You have the right to know what's in your care plan. If, if again, if you're, you know, uh, have, have care. Um, education for doctors, education for healthcare professionals. And I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll disclose this very personal story of mine. And I really had to question whether I was going to do it. it. happened to me a few months ago, but it's important. I'm the CEO of a disability charity and I'm 43 years old. I'm hearing aid user, I'm, I'm deafened and I primarily lip read. And I have a condition that, evolves, that um, affects my sexual function. I went in to a gynecologist and nobody would remove their masks. Um, Nobody would help interpret me. I couldn't get an interpreter. And before I knew it, I was having a biopsy done on my vulva. I didn't know that was happening to me. And it was one of the most traumatic things that have ever happened to me as a grown up. And I'm me. (laughs) This is what I do for a living. So this just shows how much education is needed um, to healthcare professionals as well. Um, to be able to ask the questions, which speculum can you use? You know, is it okay to use a bigger one or the average size one or whatever it is? 
um, and the assumption that, um, as, as we've we've spoken about many times, that when I was a when I was a mother and I was going to join NCT groups, um, nothing was subtitled, nothing was made accessible for me. So deaf and disabled people have children, they have sex, they want to have families, and just looking at this overarching view that education and training for me is the absolute key. But we almost need to change legislation to make sure that education happens, because otherwise people just don't bother doing it, because they don't think it's very important. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, that is a fantastic, comprehensive response. And uh, it, uh, thanks for sharing that, that, that powerful, again, a disabling experience with the, with the mainstream medical, medical society. So, uh, uh, no, what do you think is the is the way of overcoming these challenges and, uh, in terms of uh, DPOs and disabled activists? Well, first of all, can I just like respond to Jenny there for a moment? Everything Jenny said was on point. It was exactly right. Because even in Full Spectrum Ireland, we've had members looking to access even something as, you know, what we, the main LGBT community might consider rudimentary as a, a sexual health screening. But oftentimes, ISL interpretation isn't made available to them, even though it is a provision there. Oftentimes, it's removing masks to explain things clearly, what's happening. It's that medical language before. So yes, I think I'm going to have to echo a lot of what Jenny just said there. It's education for medical staff in terms of how to communicate what's happening. It's education for individual users who want to go in and avail of that space. So one of the workshops we do within FSI is just guiding a person through the process of what it's like to go for an STI screening and just to kind of get familiar because for a lot of our members, being familiar with a medicalized space like that is different because they're often run separate from the main hospital. Uh, oftentimes there's newer technologies such as rapid HIV testing. They not, might not be aware of that. So it's trying to explain to them what is the difference between the two different modes of testing and making that information aware. Everything else is advancing for the mainstream LGBT community. It's just about making sure the resources are equalized for the disabled members of the LGBT community and therefore the disabled community as a whole, because we're part of the world. We, we, as Jenny was saying, we have sex. We have sex for reproduction. We have sex for pleasure. And those are protected. And we want to nurture those for a variety of reasons, because it's about overall health. Right. Thanks. I like that uh, LGBT mentioned group, uh, the uh, fantastic work that's been done to progress the sexual health uh, opportunities that, that should be also shared with disabled people in the, in the LGBT and, and the uh, group as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that experience of uh, being involved with activism of one group and taking that activism to, to other groups too. And only uh, what do you feel your own response to the how it intends to uh, uh, deal with these challenges through legislation, promotion, or in your own case, research and policy development? Yeah, so we definitely think the Assisted Decision Making Act um, to me, Rock, um, you know, is going to be operational soon in Ireland. Far from perfect, very, very far. There's still quite a lot of problematic provisions within it but what it could be helpful is in shifting the lens around supporting people to make decisions so helping people to find information that's they can understand and use um, rather than having service providers or family members assume well I can just make a decision on that person's behalf about their contraception or their fertility or whether they're going to be having boyfriends and girlfriends and um, so that sort of shifting towards empowering people to make decisions and support rather than assuming straight off the bat you can't make decisions or just because you can't understand possibly medical information or um, jargon that you're not able to make a decision um, that is important to you. Um, other laws then as well, we know the Termination of Pregnancy Act. Um, at the minute, the provision is um, for abortion without sort of any um, legal parameters um, up to 12 weeks. Um, this needs to be extended. We've heard how difficult it can be for disabled people to access abortion, even in the best of conditions 
never mind if you're also managing um, health and different conditions um, and how difficult it can be. Like we, we have very sporadic uh, provision across Ireland anyways. Um, and then the kind of the, the ongoing <laughs> conscientious objection <laughs> um, that can make it very difficult as well for people to access abortion locally. So that needs to be revised in any kind of amendments to the law. And kind of a, a positive legal note is during the week that I saw that free contraception is going to be available um, to 17 to 25 year olds going forward, hopefully soon. Um, and this has to be done in a really non-discriminatory way. So we need to be careful how that law is implemented um, to make sure actually, you know, having a disability doesn't mean that you can be denied um, your free contraception that's available to other people. And then in terms of parenting, we definitely need better parenting policies and responses that don't equate disability as um, being a risk to the child. Um, and we know that there is a lot of overrepresentation of disabled parents in legal and court systems. Um, so making sure disabled parents have supports Again, avoiding the, the legal jargon and um, not expecting disabled parents to perform parenting to a much higher standard than non-disabled parents. Um, and we are trying to develop our toolkits to um, and touch on what um, Jenny and I have said about just basic awareness of people's access needs. So we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to contribute to some education. Um, and we don't think it should be a lottery about who is assigned to you or what doctor or nurse or professional lawyer a judge is on duty whenever you happen to use that service. Um, and really by convincing professionals and I suppose people who hold the purse strings that making um, accessibility accommodations is going to benefit all service users. It's not just investing for a minority if something's disability friendly within a health or a social service. Um, everyone who uses that service can benefit. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm using a, a headphone here with buttons that doesn't seem to work great. Uh, th thank you, Ryan. It's great to identify the, the role of impairment labels and, and the narratives that they can have an impact on mainstream non disabled thinking. And, uh, I remember myself on the board of the National Advocacy Service, where one of the first uh, directors back in 2013, the, the only disabled person on the board, <laughs> and the only person with advocacy background, was there was uh, 11,000 cases of uh, disabled parents having, having legal issues around families, children uh, as well. And a lot of a lot of that was impairment label based on that. So so uh, so with that mind the third question. Oh well actually Serena before I jump to the third question. So what do you think you respond to the uh, the uh, le uh, how do we get over these challenges that we identified in terms of legislation, promotion and training and policy development? First of all, I'd like to say I completely agree with my fellow panellists with everything they've said in relate in response to this question. Um, and I would be involved with the Reproductive Justice Project uh, since the start, and I'm quite honoured to be part of it. I, I believe very strongly in the power of change that these toolkits will eventually uh, will eventually have in relation to education and improving the the services. Um, and the rights of, of disabled persons um, with regard to reproductive justice. So, um, but uh, I suppose a couple of things that come to mind for me in relation to legislation, my focus um, very much is in, at the moment in relation to the Assist Assisted Human Reproduction Bill and everything uh, uh, in, in, in association with that. And so on behalf of ILMI, I sit on the Assisted Human Reproduction Coalition which is a, one, a grouping of a, a cross interest grouping of LGBT Ireland, uh, National Opportunity Support and Information Group, uh, Equality for Children, Irish Gay Dads. You know, it's quite a, a grouping, a diverse grouping of people. And we're all there together with the function or the focus of achieving, you know, kind of the assisted, assisted human reproduction uh, rights and, and legislation. Um, so I think that is very important, but I, and in relation to what Anya was saying about the kind of the in the the, the undue scrutiny that disabled parents um, are subjected to 
and um, there would be a concern there's a section within the, the bill section 16 and there would be concern that these kind of de facto parental capacity assessments so that's something we certainly will be looking at when, um, when we're scrutinising the bill for putting forward uh, uh, amendments. The other thing is um, when I did my master's in disability studies I focused my thesis on the area of facilitated sexual expression in the independent living movement here in Ireland and looking at the leader PA relationship and the issues that facilitation um, would raise whether it was you know kind of moral ethical or employment law um, um, and things like that and I think there's still a lot of questions needed to be answered in, in many ways in relation to that. But we think we do have to acknowledge that, you know, if you uh, need assistance with everyday life, whether it's washing or eating or whatever, well, you know, you may actually need a little bit of help to express your sexuality as well. And that could be, I think sometimes when people hear, hear facilitation, they think they go right to the end game of, you know, sex, when it could be as easy as just helping someone to order a sex toy online or to send a naughty chat text or you know whatever so we need to understand what facilitation is and then how to negotiate for it. but we also need to ensure that people are le legally protected so I think that's uh, really important and just one other thing as well is just um, in relation to running PAs there are certain restrictions um, that there's certain things a leader cannot ask a PA to do whether it's go with them on a protest march or, you know, so there are questions around what the PA or whether it's to help you is look after your child. You know, so all that needs to be looked at so that everybody is protected with uh, and in, in a good way. But there's one final thing is in relation to, for example, dignity and privacy. And as simple as simple as a pregnancy test and the difficulty that women who have vision impairment or who are blind have they have been having the privacy to get the result of their pregnancy test without somebody else having to read it to them. And in this day and age, the things we can do with technology is unbelievable. And yet we still can't make widely available pregnancy tests that are universally accessible. So there's, there are little issues as well as big issues, but they all have you know, equal impact. Thanks, Nina. And, uh, you'll be glad to know that uh, in the next uh, no magic pill production coming up in the office, in the, the Galway and the Talent Theatre, we'll be exploring that uh, uh, leader, leader and PA relationship uh, as well as the new play. So I uh, uh, hope, hope everybody can make that. So the third and final question is uh, there are two audiences here. There's the debut. Uh, uh, the Lachlis, and there's a, also a non disabled service provider. And we, have, we, have, we have quite a, lot, a great take up of the by HSE staff as well. So, what I'm going to ask you is what would, be, what would be your message first to disabled people around the sex positive security? And for non disabled people and especially those working in the, the disability sector, what would be your message to them? So, no, can you go for it? So, no, you think what would be, what would be a sex positivity message to the same people? And what would be a sex positivity message to, uh, to non disabled servers for well? Thanks, William Peter. So, for the same people, I would say don't be afraid to ask for guidance and, on sexual health materials. We have a right to our own sexual wellness, and that means being empowered to access resources. We may have to fight that extra harder to be included in the sexual liberation movement, but we deserve to be here in these conversations about our own bodies and the types of sex we enjoy. Just like the LGBTQIA community has had to, in the wake of the ongoing AIDS epidemic, learning to become sexual health promoters for our own disabled spaces can put sexual health in our community's language. Uh, I think with learning to develop the language, we are empowered to explore sex itself for pleasure, as well as overall health. Part of this could be exploring our own body through the use of sex aids or adult sex toys, as some have mentioned already. Um, for non-disabled people, I would think that having that frank discussion about sexual rights being included under human rights is key. A good strong position would be to invite your service users into a safe space and listen to their needs and concerns. 
and together develop a sexual health policy that empowers you to signpost to the right spaces. None of us know everything there is to know about sex, as it is human beings have been having sex for eons. So I think it's going to continue to happen. All we can do is to try and make it safer for people to access the information safely and as accurately as possible, so they can make the right choices for themselves. I don't know, what would be your response uh, message to the same people and not the same people? Yeah, so our project has been kind of very conscious of the labour that's involved for disabled people in accessing kind of sexual and reproductive services. And I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here, which I'm very critical of. Um, but we've really heard of people having to continuously, you know, let services know about their access needs and then that those access needs aren't even met when they turn up for an appointment you know the ramp isn't there the chair isn't adaptable or usable and people receive substandard services and that can be very dangerous particularly if it's around kind of health checks um, and cancer checks and stuff um, but with that said we've also seen that people who are aware of their rights who can advocate for themselves um, do tend to have the better outcomes, not better experiences. What people go through is still very negative on, you know, from any part of the fertility and parenting journey. Um, but in terms of the outcomes, in terms of knowing what I will or will not accept in terms of a service, I will choose to engage or not to engage. Um, and I know what I need around me in order to become a parent or to not become a parent, whatever I choose. Um, so do arm yourself as much as possible with you know, knowledge about your own access needs, if you can link in with other people who have, you know, similar access needs um, and see what worked for them, um, you'd be able to, to make those requests more clearly. It doesn't mean, unfortunately, that it's going to happen automatically. Um, and we are developing toolkits that, again, know your rights guide um, for disabled people. And on the flip side of that, then around um, staff, um, non-disabled staff within services, don't add to disabled people's labour of having to request access. Um, if somebody lets it be known to you, make sure it is noted, make sure that the intervention is put in place. Um, don't assume, well, because I made that intervention for one person with a visual impairment or a physical impairment, um, that's it now. I you know, recognise that everybody might have different needs and the same person might have different needs over the course of how they interact with your service as well, particularly if someone's becoming pregnant, they may need different mobility devices, and those sorts of things. Um, so recognise that you don't know everything, uh, be open to learning um, and try and take that labour away from the disabled person. So particularly if you're um, referring somebody on to another service, to a consultant or a specialist, you pick up the phone and you find out, is there a ramp in? Do you have information in easy to read? You know, do you know how to organise sign language interpretation? Um, before you make that referral, make sure that the service you're referring them on to um, is aware of their access needs with that person's permission, of course. Um, so they'd be two, two big takeaways from that project. Uh, thanks, I'm mean, just going to pick up on that, uh, keeping the focus on that on the table, staff members uh, uh, make the effort to listen and, and, uh, uh, and as well as uh, bringing people maybe outside the day centre into a community centre where people might, might feel a lot more comfortable with speaking about what they need. Yeah. And Selena, what do you think you would find for uh, <coughs> a message to the same people, especially those in the DPO? And what do you think, what, what would be your message to uh, not the same with the professionals in the disability sector. Um, I knew that would happen at some stage. <laughs> go for um, it. it was to, to fellow disabled persons um, and fellow disabled sexual citizens, I would say, remember you are and have a right to be a sexual citizen. And uh, you are also the expert on your needs and your wants and your desires. Um, and people who have lovely framed pieces of paper on their wall need to remember that, that you are the expert on your own body and your own, your own desires. And the other thing I would say to you is remember, um, you're boldly going where everyone else has gone before. 
and there are other people who can go on the journey with you, whether it's full spectrum Ireland or independent movement Ireland. Or I would also like to mention a group that perhaps hasn't been mentioned today, and that's Greenbow, because mm -hmm. they are vastly important to the deaf community. They're there for LGBTQIA+, plus. I hope I got all the letters, apologies if I didn't. Um, and I think they're often overlooked when, when groups are being mentioned, and I think it's uh, really important that the deaf community um, and deaf people, persons are, their needs are met just as much as, as everyone else's. So I think it's important to acknowledge their existence here today. In relation to non-disabled persons, I said, one, you are not the expert, even with the piece of paper. So listen to your client, patient, whoever it is. Um, understand universal access and provide it or learn how to provide it or link in with people who can help you to provide it. And remember, not all disabled people are passive, vulnerable or in need of care. Um, of course, there are people who do need additional support, but not all of us. Um, and we should link in what Anya said that your know, one size is not good at all. And then I just also remember disability is not a dirty word. You know, it, it's okay to be a disabled person. Life could be fab and it could be awful, just like anybody else. But like it took my husband and I, my husband's not disabled, so of course he was discriminated against by association with me. It took us 15 years of navigating assisted human reproduction in Ireland to have our child and the prejudice um, and inequality that we face and inaccessibility. And particularly a, a doctor refusing to assist us because he couldn't be guaranteed that I wouldn't have a disabled child, even though we just wanted a child we didn't care about anything else. So, you know, remember, it's not all that bad to be a disabled person. It's going to be difficult, but more so because of the barriers people put in your way. Um, so just remember that every, and everybody has the power to make some bit of positive change, whether you're a clerical officer, a cleaner, or a CEO, you can all make a difference. And just remember you have that in, in our power. Uh, how well we're showing up on the same people uh, uh, to, to recognize that they're not the experts as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so again, you all be special intended to the same people, but you come from a UK experience and, and uh, you probably don't know how strong the Irish disability sector here is. But what would be your message uh, to, to the same people uh, in terms of uh, sex positivity? Sorry, I've just got someone writing, writing an interpretation. Um, okay, so I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm, you guys have covered most of it, um, and we've got, we've got a, you know, saying that we, whenever we have a meeting with our team, we always say, "Don't come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution." And um, so I think over the years, you know, we've really tried to think what the um, terrible accent, uh, terrible American. I apologise for that. Um, but what, what's the solution? So I think it might be better actually if I run through some of the things that we do um so we run something called the love lounge and it's somewhere that um disabled and non-disabled people can write in and ask for advice you know it might be that you're a disabled person it might be that you're a family member or loved one um, um of a disabled person maybe it's you've had a spinal injury um or you've got Crohn's disease or you're asking about dating and, and these questions that I get asked in is maybe you've had a spinal injury. Is there a sex toy that I could use? I can't get in certain positions. Um, so what we do is we work with um, professionals, occupational therapists, counsellors, um, such like. And we normally spend about two weeks answering each question and we really, really research it. And then we get back to that individual. Now, actually, it was lovely. I mean, we know we work with lots of counsellors. And we know we work with lots of psychosexual therapists, particularly. But actually, today I had a phone call from somebody with cerebral palsy and she would refer to us by her GP. Hey, it's only taken 14 years. Um, but finally now, GPs, you know, yeah, exactly. And she was saying, 
actually I'm very adventurous. Um, I've got um, cerebral palsy. I've done, I'm nothing, I'm sure of vanilla. Um, I've done lots of things, but I do want to have penetrative sex. It is important to me. Everybody keeps telling me it's not that important, but it is to me. And what can we do? So we will be setting up a surgery with her and an occupational therapist and a sex toy specialist to see what we can come up with to try and look at particular sex toys or sex aids or ropes or spreader bars or whatever it might be to help her try and achieve that because that's important to her. Um, so, um, so that's something that's free for everybody to, to, to write into. And we're going to start doing live, um, private um, live surgeries soon mm. that people can book into and have one to one. Um, training, obviously, I go on and on about training, and it's really important. So we all know that. Um, but we're also bringing out our, in, our own inclusive sex toy range in the next few months. Um, we've been working on it for a very really long time because we hear all the time sex should be exciting. And in sex education, nobody ever talks about pleasure. It's never about pleasure. Uh, I mean, you're not really allowed to talk about pleasure in sex education, but sex obviously should be pleasurable. We all know that. Um, so we're, we're, we're working on the sex toy range um, to make it hopefully one of the most inclusive sex toy range that exists. Um, because as I said right at the beginning, who opens the box for you? How do you order it? How do you charge it up? If you've got visual impairment, how do you read the instructions? How do you even know how it works? Um, so all these, you know, how do you get out of the box? All those things are really, really important. And the last thing, um, th th this is for non-disabled people and disabled people and disabled people who are, who are professionals. Uh, we've created something called The Hub. It's completely free um, and we call it the sexy little sibling to LinkedIn. You go in, you fill your profile. It's not dating. Um, so you fill your profile out and there are other people that you can speak to. Say you're a researcher and you're looking for somebody to come and work with or you want to find an occupational therapist that specifically works with, um, you, know, with you on this subject. There are loads of people on there. So um, there are lots of free resources. So please go on there, use it, speak to people. And if you think actually there's a resource that I'd really, there's a bit of information that I want to know about. There's not a resource on there about something that I want to know about. Come and tell us, come and talk to us because if there's bits missing, we will create those. And we are not pretending that we know everything we absolutely don't and that's why things like this is so important that we share information and we're talking to lots of people so that wasn't a hard sell on enhance that was what we've got for free that people can use and hopefully there's some of the solutions to the problems that are existing i can tell you i can tell you back to your colleagues in the uk for uh for uh, some more enhanced training uh, in the future. Uh, so I, I promised to finish there uh, before four o'clock. It's uh, two, three, four o'clock. So uh, can I ask one uh, one quick sentence from each uh, uh, speaker? What do you want to, to say to people to take home today? So only to give me a quick sentence, what do you want to say to people to take home today? Um, just because laws and policies in Ireland don't recognise disabled people as sexual beings and as parents, don't let that stop you. It's being done, like Selena said, um, and it doesn't mean that you're not entitled to the supports to get you to where you want to be on your reproductive journey. Thanks, I'm going to you a quick response to what you want disabled people to take on today. You, have to, you know yourself better than anybody else and uh, believe in your power and stick with it. There are people out there who will believe in your power too. And um, don't be swayed by the naysayers. Definitely. And Jenny, a quick response to you uh, from your experience where you want to always to tell people to take one today. Yeah, if, I mean, if you're a disabled person, um, particularly if you do have a care plan, um, challenge that. Ask why there's nothing about your sexual identity in your care plan. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, ask for access needs and your access needs. And if you're a healthcare professional um, and you're unsure, again, keep pushing that. Keep pushing your managers. Keep asking for training, asking for clarification. What's what you're, you know, what's comfortable because. If they don't know, then they should know. And actually, they're breaking the law by not knowing and not have a policy written to support you. Um, so keep keep challenging. And now your quick response before we Very quick response. It would be that sexual health is a right for everybody and that we shouldn't feel guilty for asking as disabled people. You know, it's part of human rights. 
there is an understanding out there in the general sexual health promotion community that one of the big challenges we have to face is trying to end the idea that sexual health is an add-on extra. It's not. It's courted to personal health for everybody, and that includes us as disabled people. So, hey. don't Thanks, be yeah, it's a great, great entertainment of the time. So, so again, I'd like to thank a, a fantastic panelist, the Lena Noel, Jenny from the UK. Great to, great to, great to get, get you back. And, and thanks all you for, for, for the dialogue, fantastic, and, and your key, uh, input. And I'd like to thank you, I think, uh, all yourself and yourself. And uh, I guess we will have to say a video up on a YouTube probably next week with uh, a great video uh, editor who I've worked with for over 20 years, John Owens, but so it will be posted on, on, uh, on our webinar. And, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for, for sticking around with us. Uh, and we, 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 hope, we hope that uh, we will follow this up and we will intend to sexual positivity. We, we, we will be having another, another webinar on the 10th of September, Clear Talk. Everything you want to know about disability part three. It's on the social model of disability and it's, it's let's talk about the social model and what, what means to us. And of course, I don't know if it's a social model to say personal organization. So we just like to say, we just like to say that we hope that they, uh, not, we can't say start the conversation so that as the point of view. Uh, we, there was a, a con conference like this 20 years ago, and then my second thing I called a conference like this 20 years ago. So we're reuniting the conversation around sexuality and pos positivity. And we're also looking at the, the same person's organization, like ourselves, like Cold Spectrum, like, like the deaf community, uh, taking leadership on, on, the, on sexuality. and, uh, and uh, Encourage the disabled people to see themselves as attractive and deserving, and not only see sexuality as much as a reproduction, it's also right and it's actually, actually something that we, every human part of every human experience. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody here, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to say you're only three minutes old. So, See you all again on the 7th of November, 7th of September, a key talk for everything you want to know about sector, about disability, part three, let's talk with the social. Bye, good afternoon, everybody.